Okay. Okay, and good evening from a very wet New York area outside of Manhattan. My name is Evan Weiner. Thank you, Matthew, for inviting me uh, to talk about um, lunar landings and the space race and uh, the Cold War and Nazis, and uh, which is all involved in, in all of this. And I have to thank somebody uh, who's in Florida now, a guy by the name of Dick Hull, who um, when I first uh, got this assignment, he was one of the first people I called. I said, Dick, help. <laughs> and he said, what do you want? I said, what was it like working for NASA during the 15 years that you were there? So uh, he gave me some stories and some other people gave me stories who I will identify uh, as we go. So it's a little bit of a team effort here. July 20th, 1969 is when uh, Neil Armstrong and also Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon, the first uh, two humans, Americans, to walk on the moon. And uh, it culminated uh, about an eight-year, um, I wouldn't call it a race, but an eight-year journey to get man from uh, the launching pad at Cape Canaveral to moon, uh, a little more than eight years. And it was John F. Kennedy who decided, hey, let's put an American man on the moon and it better be American. I'm not interested in having somebody else getting to the moon and we being there second. Not a big space fan, and actually, John F. Kennedy. He said, we choose to go to the moon and these other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. Because that goal will serve to organize the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Kennedy really didn't care about space and how to get to the moon. He just wanted to get to the moon. Uh, he told uh, James Webb, uh, I'm not that interested in space. This is the NASA administrator in the private meeting where he made clear that his space priorities other than a lunar landing meant little to him, as did arriving on the moon second. Now, 1963, November 22nd, 1963, Kennedy is assassinated, and he is facing very long odds uh, getting reelected. Uh, this is, he has done nothing with the civil rights movement. Uh, Vietnam is a quagmire, and uh, space becomes really a tertiary issue for him at that point. And in fact, had he not been assassinated, he was not going to uh, uh, go after the kind of money that he needed to get man on the moon by 1969 or 70, the end of the decade. But Lyndon Johnson was committed. And uh, after he became president, he pushed to get the money to get man on the moon. Here he is talking to Webb. Uh, CBS News anchor Walter Cronkite uh, referred to the former president, Lyndon Johnson, as the father of the program. No one did more than LBJ to commit the U.S. to landing men on the moon and returning them safely to Earth. And uh, when the big Saturn rocket uh, took off on July 16th, 1969 from uh, Cape Canaveral, there is Johnson in the first row cheering on Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin. And there is Apollo 11, and there is Neil Armstrong. Um, there was some doubt that Apollo 11 would be the first manned mission to land on the moon. In fact, if you listen to these words that um, Neil Armstrong is talking about, it was kind of a kamikaze mission, maybe? A month before the launch of Apollo 11, we decided we were confident enough we could try an attempt on a descent to the surface, said Armstrong. Thought we had a 90% chance of getting back safely to Earth. Which meant he thought it was a 10% chance he was going to get killed on this thing. Uh, so, uh, I thought we had a 90% chance of getting back safely to Earth on that flight, but only a 50-50 chance of making a landing on that first attempt. There were so many unknowns on that descent from lunar orbit down to the surface that had not been demonstrated yet by testing, and there was a big chance that there was something in there we didn't understand properly, and we had to abort and come back to Earth without landing. And there is Armstrong waving goodbye to the uh, ground crew. Some photographers followed by Michael Collins. Behind him is Buzz Aldrin. When Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin made their descent above the Eagle to the moon's surface, the onboard computer had intended to put them 
down on the side of a large crater with steep slopes littered with huge boulders. Not a good place to land at all, said Armstrong. Oh, uh, I was in uh, Connecticut um, about two years ago and uh, Wilton, Connecticut, and there was a woman who went to Purdue with Neil Armstrong back uh, during the late 1940s, or early 1950s, and she knew Neil. And she told me, she said, I never knew he, could, he thought he could die on, on this um, flight. But then again, he was a bit of a daredevil when he went to uh, Purdue University. Uh, Armstrong remembers, it, I took it over manually, flew it like a helicopter out to the west direction, took it to a smoother area without so many rocks and found a level area and was able to get it down there before the fuel ran out. There was something like 20 seconds of fuel left. Now, any of you who watched the lunar landing in 1969, uh, or listen to it before it landed, as it was landed, uh, you would hear uh, Neil Armstrong say, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. And there is some voice on the other side, a guy by the name of Charlie Duke, who is an astronaut, who was working uh, the desk, so to speak, um, you know, talking to Armstrong. And he says, you have a bunch of guys about ready to turn blue here. We didn't know at the time that they were running out of fuel. Actually, even if they ran out of fuel, what they would have done is the lunar module was in two pieces and they just would have blasted off and gone back to um, the command module. Oh, it's one of the first pictures of the moon. It's a garbage bag. They threw a garbage bag there. Can you imagine if you're the lunar police and the first thing you got to do is give Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin a ticket for littering, they left their garbage on the moon. It's one of the first pictures ever taken. Uh, after a short 2.5 hour uh, moonwalk, both astronauts came back on board the module with 47 pounds of rock before taking off. Michael Collins remained in the command module, hurtling around the moon. Talk about the dark side of the moon, he saw it. And uh, preparing at an instant notice. Uh, to initiate one of 18 rescue procedures should something fail on the surface below. The last time I saw Buzz Aldrin was around 2010, 2011. It was at the Waldorf Astoria, and uh, there was a, a fundraiser, which I was invited to, and he looked just like Georgie Jessel. He looked exactly like Georgie Jessel. Now, I'm dating myself here, and some of you might not know who Georgie Jessel was, who was the Toastmaster General of the United States as he went to all these roasts. And he used to have all these medals on him. And Buzz Aldrin that day had all these medals on him. Uh, so who is it going to be, Aldrin or Armstrong or somebody else? It could have been somebody else, first man on the moon. NASA's history website, Apollo Expeditions to the Moon, tells a slightly different version of the story. The agency originally predicted that Aldrin would be the first man to step on the moon, but the lunar module posed logistical challenges that made this order impossible. The hatch was open on the opposite side where Aldrin was seated. For Aldrin to get out first, it would have been necessary for one bulky suited, backpacked astronaut to climb over another, although Kids do that in school buses, I guess. Uh, when that movement was tried, it damaged the lunar module mock-up. Actually, the lunar module was never tested on Earth. It was, uh, well, about 30 miles from where I am right now, was where it was built uh, on Long Island in Beth Page. Uh, and um, it, it was Grumman, and uh, they couldn't try it uh, on the Earth. They had to try it while they were in orbit, whether it was Apollo 9 or Apollo 10, and there were two tests of it. That was it. So there's Armstrong's long shadow. There's the lunar module, and uh, there they are. In all previous missions, according to Aldrin, if someone, a crew member, was to spacewalk, it was always the junior person, which he was, not the space commander, who would stay inside. I felt there was an obligation on my part to put forth the reasons why a commander who had been burdened down with an enormous amount of responsibility and training for activities should stay inside. Aldrin would have taken advantage of the perks had he been the first one on the moon. Armstrong never did. 
uh, Aldrin would have definitely taken advantage of all those perks. Dick Slayton was the guy who was in charge of picking the astronauts. He was an original Mercury 7 astronaut who had an ailment and never got into space. But he was with the uh, program, and he was picking the astronauts for the Apollo program. He would start Apollo 7 with Wally Schirra and Don Isley and Walter Cunningham. Their backups would be uh, General Thomas Stafford, the other astronaut I once interviewed. Straight-laced, button-down uh, general. Didn't say anything. Uh, John Young and Gene Sorlin is the backup crew. Apollo 8 would be Frank Borman, who, by the way, put Eastern Airlines into the ground, if you needed to know that. Jim Lovell and uh, Bill Anders uh, with Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Fred Hayes as the backups. Apollo 9 would be uh, McDivitt, Scott, and Schweikert with uh, Conrad, Gordon, and Bean as the backup. And um, the rotation would pick up on Apollo 10 with Stafford, Young, and Surlin. Uh, the crew, that's Neil Armstrong. Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin. Michael Collins just recently passed away. Aldrin is still alive. The success of Apollo 8 in December of 1968 meant it was time to name the crew of Apollo 11. Dick Slayton had full confidence in the existence of crews as per rotation, uh, both Armstrong's and Conrad's, and figured since there was no guarantee that Apollo 11 would be the first landing, eh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We'll just stay with the rotation. Apollo 8's backup crew became the prime crew of Apollo 11, but there would be one change. Michael Collins came back to work after surgery, and Slayton felt he deserved the spot on the first available mission. He's made the command module pilot on Armstrong's crew, while Aldrin was demoted to lunar module pilot. It's kind of a strange demotion because... Had he remained in Colin's spot, he never would have gotten to the moon. Um, so this is where demotion actually was to somebody's advantage. Uh, and also he, Apollo, he trained for the role before Apollo 8 and 9 were switched, so it made sense. The crew was not certain they would be the first on the moon. NASA had a tight sequence of missions happening every few months, and all the mission objectives needed to be accomplished for each one to get Apollo 11 to the moon in time in July 1969. And there is the logo for Apollo 11. Well, here it is. It's July 20, 1969. Armstrong takes over the landing himself when he saw the computer was guiding them to a boulder-filled landing zone. Landing was achieved at 4.14 in the afternoon, New York time. It's short time. Uh, 2014, Greenwich Mean Time. There was just 25 seconds of fuel left. Armstrong announced Houston, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. And it's time to celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. Now, my father-in-law was uh, a government employee with the Federal Housing Administration in New York. Uh, he told some interesting stories about New York realtors, including uh, Fred Trump, the Milsteins, Zuckerberg, whole bunch of other people that he dealt with uh, in the 50s and 60s. But anyway, uh, he got this envelope in the mail, which I have here, and I have no idea if it's worth any money at all. But it's the first day Man on the Moon uh, issue, 10 cent stamp back in those days, and uh, presumably that's Neil Armstrong stepping on the moon. Man's first landing on the moon, and uh, those are the Apollo 11 astronauts, Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin. And that was to the chief architect of the Federal Housing Administration, Edwin Schaefer, my father-in-law. Meanwhile, this is an image of Lunar 16. Soviets decided, hey, we're going to kind of send an unmanned spacecraft up there. and Maybe we'll be able to steal a little thunder and maybe we'll be able to win the space race part of the Cold War. The Lunar 15 mission would orbit the moon at the same time as Apollo 11, and both would be transmitting radio signals to Earth. NASA enlisted Frank Borman uh, to get some intelligence on Lunar 15's flight pattern. He was friendly with the Soviets and cosmonauts, and he got the, he got the information. The Soviets said, won't be a problem. Uh, the Earth should be able to uh, get messages from the moon from two different satellites. By the way, my cell phone here. This thing is about 15,000 times more powerful than uh, the 
computers, uh, excuse me, computers that uh, Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins and Buzz Aldrin used uh, getting to the moon and back. Lunar 15 began circling the moon on July 17, 1969. If all went according to plan, the Soviet craft could be back on Earth with a container of lunar soil a day after the astronauts returned, close enough to upstage the U.S. achievement, or if Apollo 11 failed to give the Soviets an outright triumph. By the way, Richard Nixon wrote, or his speechwriters came up with two separate speeches. One was, congratulations, we're on the moon. The other was, uh, condolences to the families of, uh, well, would be more than likely uh, Armstrong and Aldrin because uh, Collins would be able to get back to Earth. Uh, send condolences, you know, brave men who failed. Anyway, but it's July 21st. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin are about ready to get uh, out of the Sea of Tranquility while Lunar 15 is making its descent into the Sea of Creases, smashes into a mountain. It's all over. The Americans win the race to the moon and that segment of the Cold War. Dreaming of the Moon. And uh, Matt, you might have this book uh, in your library. In fact, uh, next September, I'm doing a whole series of library talks uh, during Band Book Month with uh, my censorship talk. And H.G. Wells, H.G. Wells, who wrote War of the Worlds and The First Man in the Moon, He's on the ban list, believe it or not. Anyway, um, so man's been dreaming of the moon, probably going back to the Greek days and the Roman days and looking up in the sky and there's the Big Dipper, there's this, there's this, 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 this. How do we get to the moon? Well, back in those days, it seemed impossible. But in the 20th century, this guy, Robert Goddard, had it all figured out. He was from Massachusetts and he knew how to get to the moon. Dr. Robert Hutchins Goddard, 1882 to 1945, is considered the father of modern rocket propulsion. Uh, Goddard had constructed and successfully tested the first rocket using liquid fuel on March 16, 1926, Arbor, Massachusetts. Now, he first got public notice in 1907 uh, in a cloud of smoke from a powder rocket fired in the basement of uh, the Worcester uh, Polytechnical Institute Physics Building. So he was working on rockets back in 1907. In 1914, he got two uh, U.S. patents. One was for a rocket using liquid fuel, and the other one, 1914, was for a two- or three-stage rocket using solid fuel which is exactly how Apollo 11 got to the moon 55 years later. There is Goddard with one of his rockets. Towards the end of his 1920 report, Goddard outlined the possibility of a rocket reaching the moon and exploding a, <laughs> a load of flash powder there to mark its arrival. Like, yeah, you're on the Earth. Hey, that's a quarter million miles away. Did you see that? Let's see what? That flash powder? Uh, no, it's too far. My eyes aren't good enough. But he was going to do that like he did in uh, the, the Worcester Polytechnical Institute. Uh, in 1929, his first rocket uh, carried a scientific payload, a barometer, and a camera. Um, there's a dark side to the space program, a really, really dark side. It's called the V-2 rocket, and it was designed by Dr. Werner von Braun, a Nazi. A Nazi scientist who would eventually become an American. Goddard's work largely anticipated in technical detail the latter German V 2 missiles, including gyroscopic control, steering by means of vanes and the jet stream of the rocket motor, gimbal steering, power driven fuel pumps, and other devices. That is the W 2, uh, rather, the V 2 rocket. And uh, I was in Glen Cove, uh, New York, about six, seven, eight years ago, and there was a guy around 90 years old who uh, was military. In fact, he was military in the White House under uh, Kennedy and Johnson. Um, and um, he was telling me he was in Europe in uh, 44, and he was in England. And he said the Americans had no defense for this thing. This thing, had it been mass produced, may have changed the war, according to um, this guy's memory. 
uh, the V-2 rocket. It was launched from mobile units. Each V-2 rocket was about 46 feet high, carried a ton of explosives. The first attack on London, September 8, 1944, gouged the crater 32 feet across, killed three people, injured 22. And there is the aftermath of the V-2 attack. It took just five minutes from launch to landing. The V stood for Verger Geltungswaffen, or retaliatory weapon, and was a last-ditch attempt by the Germans to reverse the course of the war. They're losing the war at this point, although that sounds like it came out of Mel Brooks and the producers. We're losing the war. Uh, who made these rockets? Well, take your pick of names. Slave labor, prisoners, concentration camp victims. Uh, for this purpose, we'll call them prisoners. Many pulled from other concentration camps for their technical skills, such as welding, worked around the clock in an underground factory called Mittenwerk near the Buchenwald or Buchenwald uh, concentration camp, in central Germany. Um, the word appalling. Uh, you know, it had to be appalling being in a concentration camp. Couldn't be that much worse being in uh, Milton Walk. Uh, but the workers lived under appalling conditions with no daylight, little sleep, food, or proper sanitation. So how did these workers sabotage some of the V2s? Because they did. Many were executed for attempted sabotage. Eyewitness accounts describe prisoners being hanged from cranes above the rocket assembly lines. Sabotage? Yeah, you could do that. All you had to do was urinate on the machines, and the machines wouldn't function. Now, it gets really complicated here, because the guy who's second from the right is Werner von Braun. Von Braun is the Nazi scientist who is the head of the rocket division, literally. And here he is, second from the right with the rocket. Werner von Braun joined the Nazi party on November 12, 1937. His family was politically connected. He claimed that he was coerced by the SS. It's been documented that von Braun didn't want his research used for military purposes, but it was. Von Braun even stated that he was coerced into working with the Nazi party. I asked Dick uh, Hull about uh, von Braun. He said he was all right. He said he was all right. He assimilated. His brother never assimilated. One thing that Dick told me when he was around uh, the Germans, and I'll get into the Germans in a little bit, they never spoke English. Always spoke to each other in German. You never knew what they were thinking, but he was thinking along the lines that these guys had not given up their ideology. Oh, there is von Braun again, uh, all smiles. Uh, he's with Himmler here. Um, so he was rather high up in the German hierarchy. The engineer who designed the V-2 was Werner von Braun. Allies realized that the, w, the V-2 was a machine unlike anything they ever had developed by themselves. When the war ended, the Americans, the Soviets, and the British scrambled to get their hands on the V-2 technology. Von Braun makes a decision, surrendering to the Americans, while the Russians got their hands on the V-2 factory and the test range. There was something called Operation Paperclip. Operation Paperclip, and there is Von Braun. <coughs> Excuse me, Von Braun there. <coughs> With John Glenn and uh, Wally Schirra, two astronauts. It's around 1960. He's the head of NASA at this point. Operation Paperclip brought von Braun to the United States and a lot of other Nazis. Operation Paperclip was an opportunity for the United States to utilize the mind power of some of the most brilliant minds that worked in Germany during World War II. There were about 1,600 German scientists, engineers, and technicians that were taken from Germany to America, including Werner von Braun. There was a lot of activity going on at that point. There were rat lines set up out of Italy, out of Spain. Uh, a lot of uh, people like Juan Perón wanted these scientists because he wanted Argentina to become a world power. And uh, he wanted them as well, but the Americans, English, and, and the Russians uh, got a good many of them. The Cold War in space. The Cold War, the democratic capitalist United States and the communist Soviet Union pitted against each other. Beginning in the late 1950s, space would become another dramatic arena for this competition. Each side sought to prove the superiority of its technology. 
It's military firepower. And by extension, it's political economic system. For 15 years after World War II, Werner von Braun worked with the U.S. Army in development of ballistic missiles. A smaller part of Operation Paperclip, Project Paperclip, sent von Braun and about 125 Germans, Nazi scientists, to America, where they went to Fort Bliss, Texas. And they worked on rockets for the U.S. Army, assisting in V-2 launches at the White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico. In 1950, Von Braun's team moved to the Redstone Arsenal near Huntsville, Alabama, where they designed the Army's Redstone and Jupiter ballistic missiles, as well as the Jupiter C and the Juno 2 and the Saturn 1 launch missiles uh, or launch vehicles. The Jupiter C orbited the first U.S. satellite, the Explorer 1, in 1958. And uh, who better than Walt Disney to sell the space program? Von Braun is pushing the program, but you need somebody to really push it. And Disney had just opened up that amusement park in Anaheim, and uh, he had shows on uh, Paramount's ABC TV, uh, which was a weak network. And uh, the whole deal behind Disneyland was Walt didn't have the money. Uh, he traded, um, he made, made trades with Paramount. Paramount put up $4.5 million to build Disneyland. They got a piece of the concessions. Paramount also got a couple TV shows, one, the Mickey Mouse Club, and the other, uh, the Wonderful World of Disney, or whatever it was called at the time, Disneyland. And uh, so, perfect opportunity. Hey, this is a generation who grew up on Buck Rogers. They have kids now. And Walt Disney can show them how great space exploration was. Von Braun was one of the most prominent advocates for space ex exploration in the United States. During the 1950s, he wrote nu numerous books, several articles for magazines such as Collier's. It's actually somebody in their 20s this afternoon at my talk. And I said, Collier's, I looked at her, I said, uh, you have any idea? She said, no. So it's a magazine that went out of business decades ago. Von Braun also uh, served as a spokesman for three Walt Disney television programs on space travel called Man in Space. Sputnik, about eight years ago, I'm doing this talk and uh, there's a gentleman sitting there and I said to the people in the audience, I said, if you are of the age, I was only a year old, so obviously I don't remember it. I said, but uh, if you were of the age, tell me, were you afraid of Sputnik? Guys, I wasn't afraid of Sputnik. That didn't bother me. Guy lived in the New York City area. So what bothered me is what delivered Sputnik into space, an intercontinental ballistic missile. It's October 4th, 1957. The Soviet R-7 intercontinental ballistic missile launched Sputnik, Russian word for traveler, the first uh, artificial satellite and the first man-made object to be placed into the Earth's orbit. No bigger than a beach ball. Well, I don't have a beach ball here, uh, but you, you know the size of a beach ball. It's filled with communications equipment, weighed about 180 pounds, had those four spindly legs. Careened through space for about three months, circling the Earth about uh, every 100 minutes, emitting a regular pattern of beep, 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 which was incorporated into some rock and roll records. Back in those days, um, not sure if it was in the Purple People Eaters by Sheb Wool uh, Woolley, but uh, there were songs that had that beep, 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 beep in it. The launch of Sputnik actually made the Defense part, uh, Department happy and the State Department because they knew money was going to come in because Soviets have taken this lead in the space race. we got to catch up. Give us money, give us money, give us money, and we'll catch up. And that's what happened. Uh, but it kicks off the Cold War space race as we know it. The United States would recover from the Soviets' early lead. An American satellite was launched from Cape Canaveral in 1958. Hey, wait, what's a hockey player doing here? Well, that's Bill Cleary. I don't know how many hockey fans there are out there, but Bill Cleary was a member of the 1956 and the 1960 United States National Hockey Teams. He's part of the 1960 uh, team that beat the Czechoslovakians, uh, rather uh, the Russians, right? right. No, they, they beat some of them. Yeah, well, they won the gold, uh, gold medal, I think. I think they beat, yeah, they beat the Czechoslovakians because some Russian came over to the bench. It was played in uh, Lake Tahoe, 
and he pointed to them that they should take oxygen and they did and things worked out rather well for them but uh, in 1995 um at Radio, not Radio City, Rockefeller Center, and then Radio City. It was a big gathering uh, from USA Hockey, and they were honoring the 1960 U.S. team and the 1980 U.S. team. It was the 35th and uh, 15th anniversaries of um, the teams winning the gold medal. Anyway, uh, to make a long story rather short, uh, Bill Cleary was telling me that uh, he said, hey, do you ever hear the story about... Uh, how um, there was uh, uh, an exchange, a cultural exchange between the Americans and uh, the Russians? I said, no. He said, well, this is how it worked. He said, uh, Eisenhower sent us in the track and field team to Russia, and we played games, and they were involved in track and field events. In the exchange, the Soviets sent the, Bolsh uh, the Bolshoi Ballet. I wasn't into ballet, but I'm sure there might be one or two or three of you who like the ballet, and I've been told they're world class. And they also sent the Moscow Circus, which was great. So I used to watch them at Ed Sullivan. And the best part of watching them on Sullivan was the dancing bears. Hey, when you're six years old, what could go, what can't, what, you know, what would be better than dancing bears when you're six years old on TV? But anyway, so these guys gather in Massachusetts, they fly over to Moscow, land in Moscow, um, the cars take them to the hotel, and the first thing they do in the hotel is they're looking around, checking for bugs, listening devices, because they're sure the uh, Soviets have bugged the room. Uh, finally, they are told, go get dressed, you know, and you got to wear your suits and ties and all that to formal affair down in the ballroom. And they get down to the ballroom. And uh, the, the, yeah, the tables are all lined up, you know, and, you know, you got your plates there and, and you got your silverware and you got your cups and all that other stuff and your soup bowl. Oh, wait, the soup bowl. You look down at the soup bowl and there... Looking at the Super Bowl is a model of Sputnik. The Soviets are intimidating the American hockey players. And I said to Cleary, I said, well, tell me something. Did you take the Sputnik home with you said, and go to jail? <laughs> but um, during the 58 tour, the United States was having trouble launching satellites. And Sputnik was used as an intimidation uh, against the American team. Uh, the second uh, Sputnik that went up featured Laka the dog. Um, she was going to give her life up for science. That was what was going to happen. Everybody knew she was going to be killed eventually. Uh, although the USSR long insisted that Latka expired painlessly after about a week in orbit, an official with Moscow's Institute for Biological Problems leaked the true story in 2002. Latka was one of 36 dogs considered for this mission. She died within hours of takeoff from panic and overheating, according to the BBC. Sputnik 2 continued to orbit the Earth for five months, then burnt up when it re-entered the atmosphere in April 1958. There is the Vanguard failure in uh, December 6, 1957. Um, there was a response, Accelerate the Vanguard Program, a joint National Academy of Sciences, U.S. Naval Research Laboratory project. It blows up on the um, uh, launching pad on December 6th. By that time, the Soviets had already achieved their second success with Sputnik 2, carrying a dog named Laka, first live animal in space. Of course, we found out all the years later, it was a failure. Uh, Explorer 1, January 31st, 1958, does get into uh, orbit. Uh, it's launched by, uh, the Explorer 1 is launched by the U.S. Army under the direction of the rocket scientist Werner von Braun. The same year, Dwight Eisenhower, the president, signed a public order creating the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, a federal agency dedicated to space exploration, and Vic Hull would be one of the first employees of NASA. Uh, Soviets are doing rather well uh, in the space race. They're sending this thing, Lunar 2, to the moon. They're just shooting it at the moon. And uh, it hits the moon, and it's another success in 1959. Meanwhile, in 1959, NASA gets down to 
uh, to work. Uh, they get uh, the astronauts, Wally Shira and uh, Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom and Deke Slayton and John Glenn and Scott Carpenter and Gordon Cooper at the end there. And uh, they're the Mercury 7 and they're heroes. Uh, they're introduced April 9th, 1959 and they're stars. There they are on the cover of Life magazine. Absolute stars. Not doing anything, but they're absolute stars. And even more so, their wives, the seven wives, their inner thoughts, uh, their worries, um, they're stars as well. What happened uh, basically with uh, these women, they were portrayed as people they weren't. They were the... Uh, they were the housewives, the women behind the men. And as we found out later on, there were some very unhappy stories over there. Uh, how do you pick an astronaut? I mean, what do you look for? A guy who tight ropes um, across the World Trade Center, although that would come later on. Uh, a guy who goes over a barrel at Niagara Falls. What do you look for? They didn't know. They had no idea. You know, um, Let's take a look at high risk professions. Uh, then finally, see, you know what? We got all these guys in the military. Let's just pick out the pilots and see where they go. And they did. But before man, or at least American men, went into space, there was the space monkeys. Here's Miss Baker. There was Abel and Baker. Uh, May 28th, 1959, Abel and Baker were shot about 360 miles up into space and experienced about nine minutes of weightlessness, which is exactly what William Shatner uh, experienced earlier this year when he went up on Jeff Bezos's uh, spacecraft. Their safe return made them huge celebrities. The monkeys appeared, not uh, the monkeys, not, not you know, uh, Mike Naismith and Mickey Dolans and Davy Jones and Peter Torque, these were Abel and Baker. The monkeys appeared on the cover of Life magazine. And at the press conference, news correspondents pushed each other and clambered over chairs to get closer, according to the New York Times. The newspaper also noted the monkeys were far less excited than the humans. They munched on peanuts and crackers. Unfortunately, Miss Abel died four days later, or after the flight during an operation to remove the electrodes that were planted in her. That's Ham, Ham the chimpanzee. He is, uh, he is integral to um, the, uh, an, an important part uh, in the link, getting uh, from unmanned spacecraft to manned spacecraft. Beginning in July 1959, the two-year-old chimpanzee was trained to do simple time tasks in response to electric lights and sounds. During his uh, pre-flight training, Ham was taught to push a lever within five seconds of seeing a flashing blue light. Failure to do so resulted in an application of a mild electric shock. So they weren't treating this uh, chimpanzee with kid gloves to the soles of his feet, but he did work cheap. He really did work cheap. Correct response, got a banana pellet. He was not merely a passenger. The results from his test flight led directly to uh, Alan Shepard's mission. Uh, that was made on May 5th, 1961, a suborbital, never got to orbit, uh, flight aboard Freedom 7. Oh, man, he is so happy. Look at this, look at this, look how happy he is. San Francisco Examiner. Actually, I wrote for the San Francisco Examiner in 2001. Space Chimp Lives! Paves the way for flight by man. I was an op-ed writer, freelance op-ed writer for the San Francisco Examiner. Oh, there's Von Braun again. Uh, this time, Dwight Eisenhower is giving him some sort of medal. Um, the guy must have had a closet filled with medals. Uh, 1960, Eisenhower transferred uh, his Rocket Development Center at the Redstone Arsenal from the Army to the newly established uh, National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Primary object was to develop the giant Saturn rockets. Uh, oh, Mr. President, it's there. You sure, Warner? It's there. It's there. That's where we're going. Oh, we're going there. Where's Warner Von Braun with John Kennedy this time? Uh, not wearing sunglasses like the cool Kennedy. And um, he's got his model of the Saturn IV uh, rocket that may take man to the moon. And uh, he's pointing out that's where we're going. You sure? That's where we're going. That's where we're going, Mr. President. 
Von Braun became the director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center and the chief architect of the Saturn V uh, launch vehicle, the super booster that would propel Americans to the moon. Just doing what Goddard laid out. Uh, one of his rockets uh, was the Redstone. That's the Mercury Redstone that lifted Alan Shepard into uh, suborbital flight. Uh, but the Russians score another big propaganda coup. First man in space to orbit the Earth is Yuri Gagarin. And he does that on April 12, 1961, while traveling in the Vostok 1. Shepard. Well, his flight's coming up in May, and uh, it was delayed a few times, and uh, Shepard also had to go to the bathroom and said, gee, it's been delayed so long. Just let me go downstairs, do my business, come back up. They wouldn't let him do it. Uh, Shepard also complained during all of uh, the countdown holds that, uh, and if you work for the government, you understand this. When the government puts out something to bid, they take the lowest bid. And he said that he's sitting on a rocket ship filled with lowest bidders material. At uh, Marshall, the group continued on the Redstone Mercury, the rocket that sent uh, Shepard into a suborbital flight. And it was a success. There he is looking at his uh, uh, spacecraft. Um, Dick Cole talked to me about hidden figures. Uh, Catherine Johnson. He said they weren't hidden. People know they were, knew they were there. Three women were the smartest people at NASA, uh, like Katherine Johnson. Get the girl to check the numbers. John Glenn would be the first uh, man to orbit the Earth for the United States, Friendship 7. Uh, Katherine Johnson. John Glenn asked engineers to get the girl, Katherine Johnson, to run the same numbers through the same equations that had been programmed into the computer, but by hand on her desktop mechanical calcula calculating machine. She says they're good. Catherine Johnson remembers the astronaut saying, and I'm ready to go. The greatest contribution done without a computer. Catherine Johnson came up with the calculations that helped sync Project Apollo's lunar lander with the moon orbiting command and service module that would land man on the moon. She retired in 1986 after 33 years at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. Mary Jackson was another woman who was essential to the program, as was Dorothy Vaughn. The goals of Mercury, well, they were rather simple. There were only six flights because Slayton got sick and they decided to stop it at six. Uh, place a manned spacecraft in orbital flight around the Earth. Check. Investigate man's performance capabilities and his ability to function in the environment of space. Check. Recover the man and spacecraft safely. Well, not quite. Not quite. Gus Grissom, second flight. Um, well, they almost lost him. On July 21st, 1961, Virgil I. Gus Grissom flew the second NASA Mercury Redstone mission. But that trip, nearly identical to Shepard's, almost ended in disaster. Grissom's capsule, the Liberty Bell 7, sank after the successful splashdown in the Atlantic, and Grissom came close to drowning. And blame for it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault at all. It was a malfunction in spacecraft. Richard Gordon took a spacewalk during the Gemini uh, days. He was also the general manager of the National Football League's New Orleans Saints because I am sure you could find a lot of football players in space. Anyway, Gemini had four goals, test an astronaut's ability to fly long-duration missions up to two weeks in space to understand how spacecraft could rendezvous and dock in orbit around the Earth and the Moon uh, to perfect re-entry and landing methods and to further understand the effects of longer space flights on astronauts. Gemini, oh, beat Navy. Uh, Gemini 6 and 7, their missions were combined because there were some problems. Uh, and uh, one of the astronauts uh, put up beat Navy because the Army Navy game was soon. Uh, the Gemini program consisted of a total of 19 launches, two initial uncrewed test missions, seven target vehicles, 10 crewed missions, each, uh, each of which carried two astronauts to Earth orbit. And it was the program between the Apollo, or rather the Mercury missions and the Apollo missions. And uh, John Kennedy, before he was killed, 
wanted to know how come this thing is stopping, which it did in May of 1963. And they explained to him, there's testing that needs to go on. Now, Dick Hole told me, he said, uh, don't dismiss the unmanned missions to the moon because they were very important. Most of them ended up in failure. Uh, Pioneer 1, 2, and the Zero, 1 and 2, were the first lunar attempts. Identical spacecrafts all failed to meet their lunar uh, objectives, followed by Pioneer 3 and 4. Pioneer 4 succeeded in becoming America's first successful lunar mission. Ranger 7, Rangers, <laughs> Ranger crafts, also failures. The Ranger program was a series of unmanned space missions whose objective was to obtain the first close-up images of the surface of the moon. The Ranger spacecraft was designed to take images of the lunar surface, transmitting those images to Earth until the spacecraft was destroyed uh, upon impact. Uh, five of, uh, well, there were six uh, failed missions. Ranger 7 finally was successful. And then there was the uh, surveyor program, uh, and that is the surveyor. Uh, it was seven unmanned lunar missions launched between May 66, January of 68. Uh, five of the spacecraft, Surveyor 1, 3, 5, 6, and 7, successfully landed uh, on the lunar surface. It's my friend Orly. Orly from uh, Iceland, and that's his father on the left. And uh, a number of years ago, we were, um, when I was speaking on cruise ships before the pandemic, and I'm not speaking on cruise ships because of the pandemic right now. Hopefully, I'll be able to in 2023 to do one or two. But anyway, so Orly uh, has a space museum in Iceland, and uh, he did talks on his museum in Iceland. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. What do you mean? astronauts in Iceland? Well, yeah, astronauts in Iceland. What happened was NASA was looking, they were around looking, what place on Earth resembles the lunar surface? Iceland, Iceland. And that's where the astronauts went between 1965 and 67. On the 50th anniversary of the astronauts training in Iceland, uh, Orly uh, had uh, his museum open. His museum is really part of a hotel that the family operates. But anyway, um, Neil Armstrong's family's there. Some astronauts are there as well. And they were reliving what they did 50 years prior. Now, from what Orly told me, Neil Armstrong, who was supposed to be working on the lava, spent a lot of time fishing and drinking beer as did the other astronauts while they were in Australia. In uh, 2015, Orly led an expedition with Apollo astronauts Walter Cunningham and Rusty Schweiker, then Harrison Schmidt, as well as the family of Neil Armstrong. They ended up in Holloran, uh, where they trained, except there was, there was new lava there, and you really couldn't see the area that they trained on because it wasn't there anymore. 32 astronauts we train in uh, Iceland, and there's uh, there are a couple astronauts there, and there's the bus that took them to the uh, central part of the country where they trained. Uh, Orly led similar expeditions with Apollo astronauts Bill Anders and Charlie Duke um, to remote areas of uh, central highlands uh, where they trained in 65 and 67 before the lunar missions. And uh, that, uh, that group is thinning out, as uh, Orly told me, and uh, there aren't going to be too many more of those uh, expeditions. Uh, Apollo 1, the Apollo program, gets off with an absolute disaster. Gus Grissom there on the left, uh, Ed White in the middle, 31-year-old Roger Chafee on the right side. They're going up in what was called Apollo 202, but would be renamed Apollo 1. Apollo 1 was supposed to be the first low-Earth orbital test of the Apollo Command and Service Module with a crew to launch on February 21st, 1967. But there was a cabin fire. Dick Hall told me about the cabin fire. He said he heard the last 60 seconds of these guys' lives. He said he heard the shrieks, the screams, and then the nothing. He said it's nothing that you ever want to listen to. But Dick Hall was part of uh, the people investigating what happened at that point. Cabin fire during a launch rehearsal test, Cape Kennedy, January 27, 1967, killed all three crew members. Virgil I. Gus Grissom, 
in white, Roger Chaffee, destroy the command module. Um, to make the test uh, as flight-like as possible, the door to the spacecraft had been sealed, and the capsule's interior had been filled with pure oxygen. High levels of concentration or high concentration of oxygen fan the flames, making it all too easy for the spark to grow into an inferno. Dick was telling me NASA cut all kind of corners and cut cost to get to the moon in 1969. He said this was a tragedy, a major tragedy, because it didn't have to happen. They didn't have to put all this fuel in there. And all you need is one spark, and that was that. He said it was really easy to investigate. The vehicle's uh, hatch was designed to open inwards. Process it took 90 seconds. They didn't have 90 seconds. As the flames engulfed the spacecraft, the searing heat inside the capsule caused the air pressure to rise, which made it impossible for the astronauts to open the hatch. Eventually, the uh, hatch would implode. The aftermath, that's what it looked like. About 30 seconds, the spacecraft ruptured. And despite the uh, ground crew's valiant attempt to rescue the trapped astronauts, all three men died of asphyxiation in less than a minute. Man flight suspended for 21 months afterwards. Cause of the accident was investigated and improvements made to the spacecraft and safety procedures. And there would be unmanned test flights of the Saturn V rocket and the Apollo lunar module were made. That is Apollo 1, it was 202, it was renamed uh, Apollo 1. And that's what it looked like. The Apollo 1 fire threw uh, everything for a loop again. NASA is dealing with the loss of a crew and also the command module needed significant redesigns. Michael Collins, though, had an interesting theory about that. Without Apollo 1 and the lessons learned from it, in all probability, such a fire would have taken place later in flight. Not only would the crew, but the entire spacecraft would have been lost. NASA, with no machinery to examine, could only guess at the causes and how to prevent still another occurrence. Yes, Apollo 1 did cause three deaths, but I believe it did save more than three later. That looks so 1960s, right? Look, man, like, wow, does that look 1960s? Flash the peace sign and all that. Wow, yay, man, it's like that. Uh, Wally Shira, Cunningham, Isley, they're on the bottom. They're going in Apollo 7. There are arguments over whether to launch at all. Conflicts over a television broadcast, complaints about the food, unhappiness with the spacesuits that required 30 minutes for the astronauts to use the bathroom. Guess they just didn't like Tang, you know? That Tang. When I was a kid, I wanted Tang because the astronauts drank it. They drank it. They never wanted it again. Wally Shara, 45 year old Mercury and Gemini astronaut, and the Navy test pilot was at the center of the disputes. After all, here he is in the center. His good friend, Gus Grissom, who he came to NASA with in 1959, was killed earlier. By the Apollo 7 fulfilled Apollo 1's mission of uh, testing, Apollo uh, Command and Service Module in low Earth orbit. Wow, here comes the Earth, here comes the Earth, here comes the Earth. JFK's words, we choose to go to the moon. JFK's goal, May 25th, 1961, get to the moon by the end of the decade, which actually was 1970. The decades always start with a one and end with a zero. Oh, there's the Apollo 8 crew, Frank Borman over there, put Eastern Airlines into the ground, Bill Anders. That looks like Tom Hanks, doesn't it? Is that Tom Hanks? Might be Tom Hanks, right? Oh, no, 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 wait, it's Jim Lovell. And Tom Hanks played Jim Lovell in Apollo 13, and Jim Lovell was in that film talking to a young Jim Lovell. Well, it's the movies. Apollo 13 actually won some awards, didn't they? Ron Howard. Uh, oh, that's the library in Beth Page, New York, and that is a mock-up of the lunar module. Beth Page was the home of Grumman. Grumman built the lunar module. Grumman's not there anymore. If they are there, it's just a, um, just really a skeleton crew. But uh, they donated uh, this mock-up, which used to be in their lobby, uh, of the uh, lunar module. And it sits right in the middle of the Bethpage Library, where I'm going to be on February 21st, 
doing a Mardi Gras talk, which I think I did for you last year, Matthew. Uh, but anyway, so if you ever in in Beth Page uh, and you ever want to see what the lunar module looked like, well, it's right there in the middle of the library. Uh, anyway, uh, Apollo 8's mission was changed in August 1968 because the lunar module wasn't available to a more ambitious command module only lunar orbit to be flown in December. Um, the lunar module is probably stuck somewhere on the Long Island Expressway in traffic. Uh, hey, the landers, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Look at that. The first picture of the Earth. The whole Earth. It's uh, Apollo 8. Uh, they circled the moon, the astronauts did, on Christmas Eve 1968. Borman, Lovell, and Anders read passages from the Bible, Genesis, basically saying the Earth is good. Don't mess with it. Dick Hole told me that uh, NASA got more fan mail after Apollo 8 than they did after the Apollo, Apollo 11 mission. Uh, the lunar module finally debuts. Couldn't be tested on Earth. Had to be tested in space environment. It debuts in March 1969. Apollo 9, the uh, third crewed mission and the first flight of the command and service module with the lunar module. The commander was James McDivitt, the uh, command module pilot, David Scott, lunar module pilot, uh, pilot rather, Rusty Schweik, excuse me, Rusty Schweikert spent 10 days in low Earth orbit testing several aspects critical to landing on the moon, including the lunar module engines, backpack life support systems, navigation systems, and docking maneuvers. Snoopy and Charlie Brown, Thomas Stafford, General Thomas Stafford, I interviewed him once and he was what you expect from a general, buttoned down as opposed to Buzz Aldrin. What you expect from Buzz Aldrin is a guy named Buzz who doesn't likes to talk. Uh, John Young and Gene Cernan, who was the last man on the moon. Apollo 10, or Charlie Brown and Snoopy, was launched on May 18, 1969, the dress rehearsal testing all the components and procedures just short of actually landing on the moon. So near, yet so far. They go within 8.4 nautical miles of the lunar surface as they're testing whether or not the lunar module's engines can fire where they're supposed to. Uh, and uh, get back. That was uh, uh, what they were doing to make sure the lunar module would work because it would be blasting off from um, the moon and head back. There he is, Dick Hall. Hi, Dick. How are you? Dick's in his late 80s now. Lives by Cape Canaveral. Um, anyway, um, here comes a story you've never heard of. It's a story NASA really does not want you to know. But I'm going to tell it to you anyway. Because it's a great story. Dick Hall is in Australia. It's July 21st, <laughs> 21st, uh, 1969. Uh, they're in Australia. He's at the tracking station, International Dateline, and all that other stuff. And um, he's the guy who's bringing the video back from the moon, so you could see it, along with 600 million other people. And uh, so, you know, they're, they're there. It's about a minute before they know Armstrong is going to pop out. They got the time schedule and all that. And Dick Hole fires up the system that's going to show you the moon landing. And this is what he sees. Oops. You know, Armstrong's upside down. That's not going to work. We have 45 seconds to air. Not going to work. Well, he runs around. Oh, here's a mirror. I can put a mirror under there. No way he'll know. His boss said, you put a mirror under there. I'm going to fire you on the spot. Dick said, then you'll be the laughing stock of the world from the 600 million people. 30 seconds, 29, 28, 27. Dick suddenly remembers, hey, we're using a new system here. I wonder if somebody didn't flip the switch. 18, 17, 16. Dick flips the switch. Well, you didn't see the fuzzy. I mean, you saw the fuzzy picture. It was right side up. Somebody forgot to flip the switch. And it almost, almost made it to air. Now, I wonder how people would have reacted if they saw Neil Armstrong upside down. But that's, that's right. That's right. They were, that's right. Oh, they go to the moon. What happens at the moon? Well, MTV starts in 1981, 
and uh, I want my MTV. You plant a flag on the moon. Billions of dollars. So MTV could have an advertisement. Oh, back in those days, 1969, the honeymooners, you know, you're going back now 53 years. Honeymooners, big, big deal. A huge deal. People knew who Ralph Cramden was. And they knew who Alice Cramden was. One of these days, Alice, one of these days, bang, zoom to the moon. So some cartoonist, cleverly, has the two astronauts walking out of uh, the lunar module, and they're looking at this woman laying there. It's Alice Cramden. Had to be there back then to understand that. Uh, November 14th, the Apollo 12 mission uh, is uh, the second uh, lunar lander. Uh, it was struck by um, lightning twice during the first minute of the flight from uh, Cape Kennedy, but they went on to uh, have the second successful human landing on the moon. The commander, Charles Pete Conrad, and lunar module pilot Alan Bean landed the lunar module Intrepid in the ocean of storms, a mere 535 feet from the, where the robotic Surveyor 3 landed and here they are checking out uh, Surveyor 3 and uh, seeing how much deterioration took place over about three or four years where the Surveyor wasn't doing anything. The Apollo program would continue through 1972. Six missions would be successful. Apollo 13 never made it to the moon because of an onboard explosion. Space exploration, Buck Rogers with Larry Crabb. You know him better as Buster Crabb as Buck Rogers, or maybe if you watch the cartoon, Duck Dodgers in the 24th and a half century with Daffy Duck. Space exploration. It was part of a serial on weekends at the movies on Saturdays. People grew up with that. But uh, no Bucks, no Buck Rogers. In March 1970, less than a year after the lunar landing, the first lunar landing, Richard Nixon signed a directive making space just another program that would compete for funding. As interest in television ratings for subsequent Apollo launches dwindled, yeah, they looked at the TV ratings. Yes, they did. The final three moon missions were scrapped, ending, with the, ending the program with Apollo 17 in 1972. Oh, Alan Shepard snuck allegedly snuck a six iron onto uh, the spacecraft and uh, in the Apollo 14 mission on the moon, played some golf. February 6, 1976, he pulled out a makeshift six iron, he smuggled on board, hit two golf balls on the lunar surface, they could still be going for all we know, becoming the first and only person that we know of to play golf anywhere other than Earth. The last man on the moon, Gene Surlin. That was December 11th, 1972, when they landed on December 14th. Just going back into the lunar lander, Cernan drove the lunar rover roughly a mile away so that the video camera could photograph the takeoff the next day. Next, he knelt, etched his daughter's Tracy's initials, TDC, into the dust. They may still be there. The Apollo 11 craft is a museum piece. This is before uh, it underwent uh, all of its uh, restoration uh, for 1969. Uh, and it took a tour of the country, ending up in Seattle and then back to Washington 2019 at the Smithsonian. Uh, on September 20th, 1970, Lunar 16 landed on the Sea of Fertility, carried uh, a sample return mission. Um, I carried out a sample return mission. Uh, Lunar 16 brought back a couple ounces, 3.5 ounces of rock. The first two Apollo astronauts brought back 120 pounds. The last of the lunar missions, 1976 Lunar 24 probe, the third successful Soviet mission to return lunar soil samples from the moon. Missions to the moon have been been uh, conducted by the Soviet Union, United States, European Space Agency, Japan, India, People's Republic of China, and Israel. The moon has also been visited by five spacecrafts not dedicated to studying it. Four spacecrafts have flown past it to gain gravitational assistance and a radio telescope. That guy in the middle, and he demanded that I tell him that Dick Hole told me what happened, was James Kennedy, and he worked for NASA 
for quite a while, this was uh, one of the cruise ships I was on, and he was uh, doing one of the lectures. In 2003, he became the eighth director of the Kennedy Space Center. He retired in 2007. He was with them for 36 years, and he was of the opinion that a private-public partnership would be the key to future space explorations. There is Cernan, the last man on the moon. There are no there are no lunar or Martian with humans aboard missions planned at this moment. There was something planned for 2025. That's not going to be happening. Still, there are plenty of experiments taking place in space with humans on board and certainly others unmanned uh, spacecrafts. They're going out to take a look at places like Pluto. Um, will there be a public Part, uh, private partnership sending somebody to Mars? Unknown. Right now, there is nothing more planned. I want to thank uh, Matthew for inviting me and everybody who is here. Any questions, any comments? The floor is all yours. Anybody have anything to say? Did um, I? I believe Warner von Braun was part of the development of the atomic bombs. Correct? No, he wasn't. No, that was the Oppenheimer people. Oppenheimer. That's right. That, that was the Manhattan Project, University of Chicago in New Mexico. He was still in uh, uh, Germany in nineteen. What is that? Forty-three, forty-three. I guess he's forty-three, forty-four is when they finally. Yeah. So he was. He was working with the V2 at that point. Okay. Von Braun. Was there, um, would you say when he came over, was there a level of distrust? You had mentioned that his brother and he only spoke German. Yeah, Dick told me that um, he often wondered about them. Um, he said Von Braun was okay. His brother, mm, not really. He said, all those guys talk German to each other. That's what they did. So, uh, yeah, but he was there for, I don't know, he was there for, what, 15 years, whatever he was there. And, um, yeah, he said Von Braun was okay. He was more impressed with the women, though, Katherine Johnson and uh, Dorothy Jackson, uh, rather, uh, Dorothy Vaughn, and uh, he's very impressed with them. Smartest people he worked with. Interesting. Um, hello. Hi, Juan. How are you? Okay. I was wondering, why do we want to go to the moon? It's a good question since we've been there, but I don't know. You know, um, there might be resources there that uh, are worth mining. Um, maybe set up uh, an area where people can work. Um, you know, maybe find out what happened how did the earth become the earth and the moon became the moon um there if you look at it in theory i mean whether there were six successful missions it brought back you know, rocks um and and the soviets uh they really don't know that much about the moon uh at least from you know the eyeball perspective obviously they know about from telescopes and other things but uh yeah because we would not be able to walk We'll, we'll be floating up yeah. and down. Somebody asked me today, would I mind being, would I would like to go to the moon? I said, at this point in my life, no. He said, uh, about being weightless. I said, that'd be cool. I wouldn't mind being weightless right now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Evan, I was, th I think what I was thinking about was when Werner von Braun was in Germany. Yeah. And he was working on V2. He was working on V2. Uh, that's the, that's a whole, there's a woman in Detroit, or used to live in Detroit. She lives in Washington now, named Aviva Klempner, who uh, did uh, DVD, The Life and Times of Hank Greenberg, Mo Berg story, You Who Mrs. Goldberg. And in her Mo Berg movie, apparently, how true it is, I don't know. Nobody seems to know, but apparently Moberg somehow gets into Germany and uh, he's a master of disguise. 
the, the old joke about him is that uh, yeah, he knew 19 languages and couldn't hit when he was a baseball player in any of them. But somehow he was there and he found out that um, German the Germans weren't close to an atomic bomb. Not at yeah. all. They weren't. Okay. Yeah, but uh, the Russians were because of some espionage. What was the, I read a book about. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. And the spy, a female spy, I forgot her name. I read it for book club, but a female spy who infiltrated the Germans and went back with the information and up to Russia. And so Russia was pretty close. Yeah. 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 I can't remember her name. Yeah. It's a lot of stuff that went on there. Yeah. Russians had the bomb, what, by 49. But they knew all about the American bomb because they had spies. So was it Oppenheimer that was in Germany that came? No, Oppenheimer yeah. was here. He was here. He yep. was here with yep. the uh, Joyce Rosenberg with him, Green Glass with him, uh, all those uh, all those guys that uh, would eventually be uh, uh, tried for uh, espionage, and, and Joyce and Ethel Rosenberg would be you know ex fried over here at uh, Sing Sing um 15 minutes from my house uh sing sing so uh, no manhattan project was uh, university of chicago and oppenheimer was brought in because he was a no-nonsense guy who wouldn't take anything from anybody okay interesting and the um rosenbergs had a kid didn't they yes they had a couple of kids yeah uh, they have a couple of kids still alive um but um you know, there's still people around here who wonder about all of it. So particularly Ethel, not Joyous, but she really didn't. And her death was horrible. They couldn't kill her. They had to yeah. kill her three times. Yeah, I heard about that. Terrible. Anybody else? Well, if that's... Yeah, the, I have a question. Yeah. So Gorbachev, Gorbachev, did he, yeah, did he have a lot to do with the Russians trying to get to the moon? No, he, even though he, he came into 80. power in 1985. Yeah, okay. Right. So that was yeah. long afterwards. Okay. Yeah, you know, was Stalin, Khrushchev, Khrushchev, Khrushchev. Okay, that's who I was thinking yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. Khrushchev. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Who's granddaughter is running around on TV talking about uh, the uh, Ukraine-Russian war now. She's an American. Interesting. Well, Evan, wouldn't they uh, want to go back to the moon to practice colonization in space? That's what I'd heard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, who knows what their plans are, you know. Um, keep talking about going back, but, you know, Cernan was, what, 49 years ago now, and they haven't made any attempt to go back. Um, but again, a lot has to do with no, uh, no bucks, no bucks, Rogers. Hmm. You're not funding this thing. They're not going to go back, which is why Kennedy, Jim Kennedy, not John Kennedy said the key is going to be public private partnerships in the future. Hi, um, have hi, Wanda. Ever... Hi, hi, Wanda. Hi. how are you? Good. You? Thanks for the program. It was very interesting. I missed the first half, unfortunately, but um, but I got the last half, and it was but very it's, good. I, he, Matthew's recorded it, so he could probably put it up on um, in social media. Oh, great! Um, just a question about um, uh, on the moon. Was there have there been any attempts to try and grow like plants or produce there? Nothing. Nothing. Because nobody's okay. been there since 1973. Yeah, but back when they were there, they didn't try no, to grow. Yeah, no, they just, let's get the rocks and get on out of here. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. Well, hello. Yes. Hi. Uh, uh, so question. I mean, yeah. there's no water, so there's no point of growing anything, right? I guess not. Or, or you can bring your own water, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. Or manufacture it because that'd be awfully heavy. Yeah. <laughs> or you could throw it out you know, as soon as you get there. 
I like when you said you hit the golf ball. You're probably still going. Probably still going. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Thank you.